Good morning to you. I am Mark Suddeth in Wilmington, North Carolina. It is now Tuesday, the 18th day of April 2023. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about. I'm back from family vacation. Spring break is done. It's now time to get back to work. We've got a lot to go over. We're going to talk about some of these seasonal forecasts. There are a lot of them, a lot of different agencies and individuals, universities, you name it, lots of people putting out forecasts. We're going to look at Colorado State and the University of Arizona, and then a lot of different tweets from people that are putting out some really interesting info here as we close in on the start of the 2023 Atlantic and, of course, the Eastern Pacific hurricane seasons. We're getting close. These forecasts now are really going to start to come under a lot of scrutiny. We're going to be able to look at different things and see how they verify over time. And a lot of this big hint is completely, almost completely dependent upon the development of that El Nino that we've been hearing much about in the recent weeks here. So basically, a subtitle to this update, Keys to the Game for the 2023 Hurricane Season. That's the way I look at this. Uh, I don't like that word game. It makes it sound less important. But we know how important this is. Hurricanes, a very big deal. We're going to look at that and, of course, some lower 48 weather news uh, and severe weather, which, uh, at least luckily, the next few days, not widespread and not too alarming, although it is mid-April and we do have to deal with some severe weather out there. We'll take a look at that as well. First, Colorado State University issued their forecast. Dr. Klotzbach presented it last week down on South Padre Island. 13 named storms, six of them becoming hurricanes, two of those hurricanes becoming major. With an A score of 100, that's the accumulated cyclone energy right there. And this is really, really important, so let's make this color red. 55 of those ACE points are forecast to occur west of 60 degrees longitude. Now, I know everybody out there knows their latitude and longitude, right? Right? And... We all live, pretty much everybody that watches these videos, pretty much I'm like 99.9% .9 live west of 60 longitude. You know, anything east of that, in terms of Atlantic hurricanes, yes, we have people that live in England and Europe and elsewhere just as a whole. I get that. I'm talking about for hurricane threats, a majority of the people out there that are interested in this stuff live west of 60 longitude. 55 ace points. There's a lot of land in the way of those ace points. All right, That's not the open Atlantic. That is where the rest of the ace points are forecast to occur, roughly 45 or so, right? Now, this is lower than the 30-year average of 73, but still, that's an interesting number there. 55 ace points occurring west of 60 degrees longitude. A lot of land out there, a lot of people that could be in the way of those ace points. That's wind energy, the accumulated cyclone energy, a very important metric beyond the names and the numbers. That's a really important number there. All right, so let's contrast this to the University of Arizona. Uh, the forecasters here, Davis and Zhang, they are predicting nine hurricanes, so three more than Colorado State, five major hurricanes. That's a lot. All right, that's three more than Colorado State as well, with 19 name storms total. That's a lot of name storms and an ACE score of 163. And you can read all about this in these paragraphs here, some of their reasoning. I will put a link to this forecast that's a PDF file in today's video discussion in the description. Basically, they are putting a lot of weight on this very, very warm Atlantic, which I'm going to show you more of in just a few minutes. So an interesting pair of forecasts from reputable sources here. This is the University of Arizona. They've got a pretty good track record. Colorado State University, either Bill Gray or now the lead author being Dr. Klotzbach have done this for many decades. Yes, there have been some misses and yes, there's a lot of uh, aspects to the forecast of numbers that people don't understand, how to interpret it, what does it mean for you. It just means, hey, hurricane season is coming these are the keys to the game, like I said, things that we need to look for, and I'm going to break down what those things are as we go forward, all right? So speaking of going forward, let's go over here to this tweet, also very recently from Ben Noel. Um, this is the velocity potential from the Euro, the ECMWF, for the spring and through 
and into the summer, going and ending there in September. This is as far out as it, as it goes. So there's April right there. There's May. We'll leave those behind. Let's stop this animation on June. And look what happens in June, according to the Euro. A big rising cell over Western Africa. Very strong upward motion there. And with the very warm Eastern Atlantic, I guess that makes sense. You could have a very moist Africa and the, and the intertropical convergent zone region. So this could spit out some tropical waves early, seeding the Atlantic potentially fairly early on. Also notice the rising cell over southeastern Pacific areas. So we could have a pretty quick start to the Pacific hurricane season. We'll have to see. Then you've got a lot of sinking motion going on across the maritime continent region near the Indian Ocean and vicinity. And uh, that's, really, that's really interesting, that overall look, a favorable upward motion pattern for the Atlantic in June. Normally you would think with an El Nino that you'd get a lot of sinking air, or this red color right here, or whatever you want to call that, uh, over here. We don't see that, not for June. It's going to take a bit of time for the effects of El Nino to take shape. So what happens by July? Same kind of thing, rising motion in the vicinity of Africa and the offshore waters, still a lot of rising motion in the Pacific, sinking motion over here across the maritime continent and parts of the Indian Ocean. Moving on to August and September, the September of course being the peak of the hurricane season, stronger sinking motion here, some rising in the West Pack, a pretty solid signal in the Eastern Pacific, so we should have a very busy Eastern Pacific hurricane season, but this is not entirely like season cancel, as they say, especially at Storm 2K, uh, an inside moniker or joke or whatever you want to call it that the folks at Storm 2K have come up with over the years. This does not scream Atlantic being shut down. It's not altogether favorable, like, whoa, this is going to be another 2020 or whatever, but that is not the look of no hurricanes. So a very interesting set of data coming in, not making anything very clear. The keys to the game are kind of muddy right now. We've got some favorable, some unfavorable, all mixed together. It's just kind of wild. So let's look at the unfavorable first. The primary reason, as Phil Klotzbach talks about here, Dr. Klotzbach, for the slightly below average forecast, of course, is the El Nino. And, I mean, it's pretty much all going to come down to this. How strong does this warm ENSO event, El Nino Southern Oscillation, get? The Euro is forecasting ridiculous, like really, really warm El Nino event. Um, some of the other models, not so much. We shall see. Uh, the other aspect to this, and this is just some of the graphics that he has included, very, very, very uh, robust El Nino accounts for the slightly below average forecast, okay? Now on the other side of the argument, in favor of, uh, this is just crazy, and we've seen this when I've done, done my updates here with the Coral Reef Watch map, uh, the anomalies map. This is the anomalies map here. This is over from weathermodels.com. Uh, Dr. Klotzbach tweeted this. This is a classic signature for a very busy season very, very warm water compared to normal off of Africa. Cool up here in the subtropics. Now listen to me closely. This is very different from last year, where the water temperatures up in the high latitudes here were way above normal. Now it is that colder water relative to average north or over the warmer water. So let's get rid of all this scribble. So you have colder water over warmer water, that is more of your dipole look, di meaning two, of a very busy season if it weren't for the oncoming El Nino. So you see what I mean, that El Nino is everything. Because if it fails to come on and overwhelm the Atlantic, and I'll talk a minute about how that could happen, what that means, we could have a very busy season with way more activity than Colorado State is currently predicting. And he does mention this in some of his description and text product of the forecast. So make sure, if you want to, to read that. He does mention that the ranges are ridiculous. And of course, we've talked about this a lot too, the Gulf of Mexico, anomalously warm, but that doesn't really change the outcome of hurricane season. The Gulf 
is kind of its own independent area and it's always warm enough for intense hurricanes. This graphic here is remarkable. Why? Think of this as a visual representation of checking off boxes. You check the box and you have pros and cons or for and against. With all of these areas filled in, for the most part, if you want to call it that, with reds and oranges and, and whatever, you don't have any blues to speak of and very little base map color, you know, or white. Everything's right here in, in these colors. Look at all that. That is check boxes being checked for favorability to correlate for a busy hurricane season. That is remarkable. When you look at this, you go, man, a lot of boxes are checked for it to be a very busy hurricane season. These are the different products that Dr. Klotzbach and his team uses to help build their forecast. And this is strongly arguing for a busy season, weighted against the argument of El Nino putting a damper on things. So let's keep going. Speaking of El Nino, our good friend the Southern Oscillation Index, a wonderful way to keep up with all of this. Remember what I've been saying, minus seven or lower is typically what the Bureau of Meteorology over in Australia gives us as a guidepost for the atmosphere has become El Nino-like, minus seven on the SOI. The 30-day is barely negative. We can just statistically call it flat at zero or neutral. The 90-day is still a healthy plus 4.64. And today's contributor is only a little meager minus one. Look at our little graph down here. Generally, it has been flat. Just a slope. I mean, it's really, really not that steep at all. In other words, the SOI, the Southern Oscillation Index, not tanking, showing us that the pressure pattern is leaning towards one that's just like a big rock rolling down a hill towards El Nino. This is very interesting to see. We're not getting there very rapidly just yet. All right, let's move along. This is extremely important right here. The Hovmuller diagram from Dr. Ventress, uh, Dr. Michael Ventress. All right, so these are our westerly winds. Where? Down at the equatorial region between 5 south and 5 north. The reds and oranges in here and uh, any, anything that's not blue, basically, that's your westerly wind anomalies at 5,000 feet. That's what that means right there. The blues are stronger trades. And let me get me back on. It just helps when I talk to you and not at you. So the blues are stronger trades. The reds are weakened trade winds. And the trades act like blowing across the, cop, the top of a cup of coffee to cool it off or your soup or whatever the case may be, right? The stronger the trades, the cooler the water temperatures typically are through a lot of processes, okay? And in the Pacific over here, when you get these anomalous westerly winds across the time frame that we're looking at here, that helps to get that warm water to go across the Pacific in the subsurface, rise eventually, and warm the surface. It's very complicated, but it's like a conveyor belt. And those reds in there help to make that conveyor belt run. They're like a start button. The blues that we saw through here help to stop that conveyor belt. So look in the Atlantic. We've had a lot of relaxed trades, a period here where you've had some enhanced trades. But look, we're getting ready to get a really reduction of trades there around 60 west. There's that magic number of the ace. A lot of the ace is expected to happen or at least 55 points, according to Dr. Klotzbach, west of 55. And look at that. It's going to be pretty warm anomaly-wise because a reduction in trades allows the water to warm. And to that point, let's check this tweet out from, uh, how do you say that anyway? Deline, Delan, Delon? I got to message him and ask him. I always like to know. But the tweet is what I want to show you here. For what it's worth, he says, there's an increasingly strong model consensus for a strong negative, uh, well, the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation, a lowering of the pressures in the next week as a large low gets cut off south of the high latitude ridging. As a result, this is huge, trade winds are expected to weaken further across the tropical Atlantic. Really? This tropical Atlantic that we just looked at that's already well above normal out here? Trade winds are going to relax even more? Yep. 
and any warming associated with this negative NEO will add to the already anomalously warm state of especially the eastern main development region. It'll be interesting to see, as he says, if this lasts into the hurricane season. So let's look at these anomalies. Let's see if this updated yet to the 17th. It's always a day behind. I think it's around noon or so that it gets updated. Doesn't matter. This is the Mercator projection map of the anomalies across the globe. And there's our attempt at an El Nino coming on right there. There's the warm eastern Atlantic, the very warm Gulf, and the coolish to normal subtropics, high latitudes. This is also really con uh, confusing to me in terms of how to make all of this fit together. You know, we talk, talk about keys to the game or puzzle pieces is another analogy that I use. That cold PDO look, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, cold PDO is something that we haven't seen with a strong El Nino. Normally when you get a raging El Nino through here, this is also very warm compared to normal. Right now, it is not. In fact, it is colder than average, as you can see there. That's what the legend tells us. The blues mean colder. It's interesting because in 2015, a good friend of mine that works with marine mammals uh, at the Georgia Aquarium, he was out in the southwest uh, United States, specifically near San Diego, when we had the onset of the major El Nino of 2015. And I realize now I should have had a map to show you. But these water temperatures were well above normal back then. And there was a problem with the food source out there because of that. And there were a lot of stranded uh, sea lions that had to be rescued. And his team did a big part of that. That's a whole thing. You can probably look that up online. The 2015 El Nino brought in, I mean, a major uh, mass death event for marine mammals there in the northeastern Pacific. We're not seeing that this year, far from it. The waters are colder than average by a pretty good margin there and over a pretty huge geographic area. I think that's very interesting because we haven't seen that before. So this El Nino that's trying to come on through here, it's got a lot of work to do. It really does because this is overwhelming. That's really interesting. Big question mark for how this ends up because I don't know. There's a lot of forecasts for it the El Nino to come on strong, but until it does, these other signals are certainly very interesting. Here is the Gulf of Mexico uh, in vicinity, nice and warm, relative to average, way above average generally. Even the southwest and western Atlantic, warmer than average. There's our burgeoning El Nino down there. Pretty small geographic area right now of anomalies that are on the positive side, so we'll see. Another interesting thing to note, this is the Gulf of California. Look how cold it is relative to average. And I wonder with all the snow melt that's going to happen up here in the Rockies, feeding the Colorado River through here, I'm just kind of drawing it in, if that will help pump more fresh water and thus cooling into the Gulf of California. Every little bit matters, these little microclimates. I don't think I've ever seen the Gulf of California that cold relative to average, those cold anomalies. Just a very interesting thing to keep an eye on uh, as we progress. And again, with these tools, we can do just that, keep an eye on all kinds of things. Another look at all of this. Now, this is a cross-section of this right through here. You understand? So if we took a slice right through here from the surface down to several hundred meters, this is what it would look like. There's your very warm anomalies in the eastern Pacific near the surface and then a large warm pool at the subsurface, and then an island of cool within an ocean of warmth. Nice little way to put it. But this is the key right here. Does this amplify and overwhelm everything, make it to the surface, and really spread across, again, like I said before, like butter on warm toast or whatever? That's the key, getting that subsurface warmth to get to the surface and really get that El Nino going. How do you get that from those westerly wind bursts? Remember, I was talking about that earlier with the Havmoller diagram. That is what helps to get this right here, these warm anomalies, to move across the Pacific in what's called a Kelvin wave. That, that's the pushing mechanism. It's a very slow process, takes weeks and even months. 
But if it's not there, that westerly wind burst to drive that conveyor belt, you don't get an El Nino. It's that simple. All right. So that being said, it's going to be really interesting to see if we get more of these westerly wind bursts or not. I've seen some tweets here and there that maybe we're not going to see anything anytime soon. In fact, we might even be coming up to a period for most of May, a critical moment in all of this, of enhanced trade winds. We go back to the Hofmuller diagram. <gasps> there they are. Now they're not ridiculously strong, but that's not westerly winds. This is the end of April, roughly, and then as we get into May, I think there's even more of that coming. That's not westerly winds. I'm just saying, we shall see. Every day starts to count now as we get closer and closer to the start of the season and how important El Nino will be to shaping things. All right, now let's take a look at severe weather for the next several days. This is the day one outlook. Not too bad out there. Marginal risk up through the high plains down through the traditional tornado alley regions. Tomorrow, though, a little bit better chance of some severe weather out there. Supercells, the tornado threat very low. The wind threat higher. The hail threat is the biggest of the hazards, the biggest threat of the hazards from Oklahoma through central Kansas up through parts of Nebraska and Iowa. And by the way, this part of Iowa over here, uh, along the Mississippi River anyway, some flooding going on from spring snow melts. Thought I would mention that. Final of the day three outlook, this would be Thursday. The severe weather potential really sags down towards the Arklatex region. And then days four through eight, a 15% severe area introduced for parts of Louisiana and Texas. You can see that here. And then days five through eight, not much going on. All right. Well, we certainly covered a lot today. And, um, you know, at the end of it all, I think this is going to be a very interesting hurricane season coming up. Almost all the chips are going to be on El Nino. That's going to be the key to this whole thing. How strong does this El Nino get? And if it fails to get strong enough and that very warm Atlantic compared to average, remember, these are anomalies. Remember that. That's going to be a big key to this whole thing. And right now, there are definitely some conflicting signals. And we could end up with a very busy season or a very lackluster season. But one thing, despite our best efforts, nobody knows where these will end up for sure. You might have regions that could be more susceptible than others, maybe. But nobody could know that there would be an Ian or a Fiona exactly where they occurred last year as an example. So just keep that in mind. The numbers are one thing. The impacts are totally separate and we have no idea about those impacts this far in advance. All right. All right. Let me get this processed and online for all of you. Don't forget over here on YouTube where you're watching this, subscribe to the channel. Come on, let's make it happen. Get you going with updates as often as I can put them out. Our live events, hit that notification button, like, share with your friends, colleagues, Whatever. It's just great to have you along. I do appreciate it very much. I am Mark Sutter, Hurricane Track. That's us again here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. That's the brand. I'll be back with another update for you next Monday.